Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Overanalyzes. Today, we're looking at chapter 40 of Kaiju number 8, and this will be full spoilers. We're going to, we're going to give all the spoilers. So, here, I'm going to give you a chance to click away. I'm going to give you a chance to go check out my book, Humans Are Weird. I have the data, a book of science fiction absurdity. And go. you can go check that out, ebook, parent book, and audiobook at all the major retailers. So, you've clicked away, you've come back, you're ready to hear the spoilers. Chapter Chapter 40, like many of the chapters in this series, is it really an exercise in building relationships between these people. We get a look at the social relationship between Mina Shiro and Jin Narumi and how as the captains of the first and third divisions respectfully, they're, they're viewed by the general population. And we get a look at how Kikoru is settling in with her new division. And I, but then... We get back to our main boy, we find out what's been going on with Kafka. So, what apparently what has been going on with Kafka is he's been sitting in a cell for five days, just waiting. He's not restrained. It's actually a fairly decent sized room, more than most college more space than most college students have. But he's been taking this time to just do physical exercises. You know, it's the classic uh, competent officer who's being held in a cell scene. We open up, he's doing push-ups. You can tell he's been doing them for a while, sweats dripping off his chin onto the floor, and he's just itching to get out there and do something. And he finally gets gets his chance. Uh, the director general brings him into his office and introduces him to none other than first division captain Jin Narumi. And you also have Kikoru and Hasegawa there, the vice captain of that division, and our best girl. And this is just a very interesting move on the general's part. I didn't know exactly where they were going to be putting Kafka, but this is not something I was expecting. What I was hoping for, not really expecting, but hoping for, was that... The, the general director would train Kafka himself because the general director is such a brawler and I'd just love to see some fight, some more, some actual sparring sessions between them. Not a fight, but where the general was teaching Kafka how to use that super powered punch most effectively. But the general director is a very busy man, so it's not surprising that we didn't get that. But what we do get is Kafka being put into a very interesting situation. And again, General Director General Shinomaya, he's a clever old war dog. And there's gotta be a lot of various reasons. The first and most obvious one is that if Kafka goes crazy again and loses control of his body, in the first division, not only is everyone there, as we learned last chapter, at a power level above Kikoru, or at least at Kikoru's level, so that even if no, even if there's only one or two of them that could take out Kafka solo, any group of them could effectively take Kafka out. So from the perspective of keeping an eye on the dangerous kaiju, kaiju number eight, it's the best place to keep him. Two, this both relieves a tremendous burden from the people in the third division and shifts it over to someone to whom it won't be such a big burden. Because if Kafka needs to be disposed of, if Kaiju number eight goes bad, turns out to be a sleeper agent, just goes berserk and goes crazy, if he was with anyone from the third division, that would put a tremendous emotional strain. They probably couldn't take him out. Meanwhile, in the first division, they have no emotional connection to Kafka, so if they need to do their duty, Duty, they can. But that's just the one big obvious reason. The second big obvious reason is that the first division is the division that handles fast threats, threats that appear quickly and need to be dealt with. The third division, they're, they're given the threats that you can take some time with. They're like that big fungal kaiju. It took them several hours to mobilize, get everything ready, and they did a concentrated unit attack formation. The first division, rapid re rapid analysis, rapid response, and that is exactly what Kafka is best at. Kafka can g go, go into the fray, start punching the thing because he's invulnerable, just like Kikoru does, and analyze it as he goes and report data back. The For now, the first division is probably the best use of Kafka's unique talents as kaiju number eight. Then you have a host of other reasons. Note, I don't call them lesser reasons. First off, 
anywhere outside of the third division, Kafka is going to be in danger. There's a whole lot of people who are going to say, look, even if Kafka is a human, he's tied up with this kaiju. That's a threat. We need to kill him. And in the first division, Kikoru is there right now as an attendant, sort of like a personal assistant to the first division commander. This gives Kafka a level of protection that he would not have anywhere else because you have the the, the captain of the first division who is has clearly stated that he will have no qualms killing Kafka, but you have Kokoru there who is a powerful force to protect Kafka, not just saying that she would be physically able to stop someone who tried to attack him. Not exactly that. Even, even not mostly that. Mostly her example of trust and faith in Kafka will affect those around her. Now, as you've probably noticed, I try not to swear in these videos. And this is just something that carries over from my everyday life. I'm not comfortable with swearing. And while I generally don't mind or pay attention too much when other people do swear, the fact that I'm not comfortable with swearing, it tells on other people. I've noticed this in my, in my careers when I have to work with crews and other people. The people around me just don't swear much. And I just thought that was normal. But then I, the other crews would say, yeah, that why, don't, why doesn't anybody in this crew, you know, use these words? And nobody ever said it was, you know, because of me. But I often had co-workers apologize for accidentally swearing around me. And I would tell them, no, no, it's fine. It's your language, your mouth, you, your choice. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but you don't like it. And besides, I usually they give me the excuse that they're, they're trying to go for a promotion. And when they have to deal with the bosses, they need to not swear in situations like that. So they're trying to work on being more professional. But just by example, it seemed that I had an effect on the people around me. And it's not just for swearing. Uh, in the jobs where I work, they're pretty physically demanding, and it's really, really important to keep yourself flexible. And we're actually given specific breaks where we can, an extra break to go and stretch each day. But, you know, most people do generally don't take advantage of it. They just want to sit down. I noticed that on the seas, in the seasons where I would go out and make an effort to do the stretching and loosening exercises that would keep my body healthy while we're doing this tough job, many, many more of my coworkers would come out and do it with me. And I wasn't inviting them. I wasn't suggesting that they do it. But if one person in a work group behaves in a certain way, it really does have a ripple effect and causes all of the people around them to behave in that way. And this, this is something I noticed in college, too. I was always very open to asking my professor questions when I didn't understand something. And I kept having professors say about pretty much every class that I was in, wow, this class is so interactive, so much more interactive than my other classes have been. And I, the first time it happened, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I have a fun class. But it kept, ha kept happening and kept happening. And it turned out it was myself and there was one other kid in, who went through a lot of my classes with me. And we would both ask questions. And that led the rest of the class to ask questions. And it actually changed the entire tone of the classes as a whole. So this is, I think, the protection that Big Daddy Shinomiya has put in place for Kafka. By putting Kafka in the same unit as Kikoru, who instinctively trusts him, but who won't demand that anybody else trust him, he is having Kikoru lead by example and offer that level of respect and kindness that will be ultimately be the greatest long-term protection that Kaiju Number 8 ha and Kafka has, because if Kikoru's example can lead the first division to respect Kafka, that will cause the rest of the defense force to also kind of absorb that behavior. Now, and then you have another reason. We've seen very clearly that our initial impressions of Big Daddy Shinomiya were wrong. We thought he was this heartless marionette who only expressed his love towards his daughter by making sure that she was the very best that she could be and driving her onward even in the face of dangerous situations but as his character or develop as his character development has unfolded 
we see that he is a genuinely caring man who wants to preserve life and protect people. No one dies on his watch. That is the principle that he he embodied, that he represented for Kikoru and that Kikoru was mimicking. And so he wants to protect Kafka and he wants to protect his daughter and he doesn't want her to get hurt. And what better way to do that than to put the giant super powered kaiju transforming soldier who he knows has a dedicated interest not only in Kikoru's physical health but in her mental health and happiness and so putting Kafka in there not only protects Kikoru's body because by because Big Daddy Shinamaya knows that K Kaiju Number Eight and Kafka are, are both there, ready to take a bullet for her at any moment, but it will protect Kikoru's heart. Not to be sappy and sentimental, but having a friend there is someone who will keep Kikoru on the straight and narrow, as well as keep her morale up. Because, again, people follow the examples of others around them. And this goes both ways. So even if Kikoru is a shining light of order and perfect behavior, she's just been dropped into a into a division that is chaotic and sloppy and as excellently skilled as they are that leads to mistakes so putting kafka someone who is completely who has mastered all of the meticulous behaviors that lead to this success no matter what your skill levels are the caution the carefulness the logical analysis the the ability to follow protocol and still make it work for you in a flexible situation. This is backup for Kikoru, so she's not too badly corrupted by Captain Narumi's terrible example. And it's not just Kikoru who this is going to benefit. By putting Kafka in the third division, Kafka who has a who is older, more mature. Now, people who are older, mature, and more confident often have a greater impact on those around them. Younger men especially will kind of imprint on older men. And while Captain Narumi is probably not too flexible at this point, I mean, if Hasegawa hasn't uh, get shaped him up and gotten him in the line at this point. Nothing will ever get, turn him into the perfect officer, but by having someone who's significantly older than him, who follows the rules, and who has tremendous levels of power and skill, because no one knows Kafka is in Kaiju number eight skill level better than Big Daddy Shinomiya at this point. And by putting Kafka in the same unit with Captain Nar Narumi, this gives an example for Captain Tarumi, so Narumi, someone who Narumi will definitely come to respect over time and who will set that example of, you know, actually following the rules and... And now I'm going to try to say this very carefully because I don't want to imply that the captain of the first division, Jin Narumi, doesn't care about people. But one thing he really does care about is competence and he himself is... In, is has overwhelming skill and competence and he doesn't care about all of the little things like you know diligence that people can, can also excel in so it gives him a very arrogant personality and one of the reasons that it will be beneficial to have Kafka in his unit because Kafka genuinely cares about people and more importantly, he's very humble. Kafka has eaten crow so many times. He's been face down in the gutter, essentially. He's been at the bottom. He, he knows what it is to climb your way back to the top after you've made mistakes, after you've failed. I don't think that's an experience that Jin Narumi has had yet. And given this type of manga, it is... I'm not going to say it's almost a given. It is a given that Captain Jin Narumi is going to make a mistake. He's going to fail terribly. I mean, it's just a natural part of the character development for these characters. And when he does, maybe Kafka will be there to help him out of this. Uh, we'll see. That is, if that happens, it's going to be a story arc I'm really looking forward to. Now, th that's just the... I've talked so much just about the motivations behind Big Daddy Shinomiya making this move to put Kafka in with the First Division. Now, let's talk about something else. The emotional whiplash you get from the character development of Jin Narumi in this chapter. When it starts out, he is childishly freaking out because the newspaper or magazine that he's reading... Uh, print, 
printed the articles about the, his defeat of the Godzilla kaiju in such a way that to a casual reader, it looks like Captain Ashiro defeated it. And apparently there's more than just a rivalry between Captain Ashiro and Captain Narumi. Captain Narumi was just freaking out. He was doing something called ego surfing, going online, commenting, making a fool of himself. And people were commenting back on him about his lack of class. And you just see a really emotionally immature guy. And Kikoru's just there sitting in the background. Try, you can tell from her eyes that she just spent a ton of time trying to make it compute that the super competent kaiju slayer she'd seen take out Godzilla was this completely childish, immature teenager running, running around his office whining because he wasn't getting credit for what he did. And you can just see the flat look in her eyes that she's just given up trying to make those two things compute and she's just waiting for her chance to go out and help slay a kaiju at this point. She just wants to do her job and get be done with his attitude. And you're laughing and enjoying this. Ah, he's not a bad guy. Look at him. Yeah, I mean, sure, he tried to kill Kafka, but Kafka was trying to kill... Because kaiju number eight was trying to kill Journal at that point, and you're just really enjoying this. Then, the director general drags in drags Narumi and Kafka into his office and they're sitting there the, the general director states his goal of putting Kafka in division number one or his orders to that effect and Kafka he's like well I don't want to be considered useful because of kaiju number eight but survival is my main priority here I'm all for this let's go I'm going to prove my usefulness and at which point uh, Captain Narumi says I decline and he turns around and then he just starts breaking out the brutal, what he believes to be simple, brutal truths. He says, look, if you wanted this guy to be useful, you should have basically chopped him up for pieces and made a weapon out of him for me. And he says this right in front of Kafka, right in front of Kokoru and to the general director's face. And then K Kafka does his thing. He tries I don't think he's trying to charm him, but he says, look, I can't die yet. I have a goal to which Captain Narumi says to Kafka, I don't care about your goals. I don't care about your emotions. Show your overwhelming skill. And if you go berserk again, I'll kill you and wear you as a suit. At which Kafka, you know, he says, of course, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, the emotional whiplash you get is just fascinating. I think this is very deliberate on the part of the creator because in so much modern media, we, we want to like the heroes, we want to dislike the enemies, and that's it. No emotional complications. But here's a guy, he's definitely set up as a classic shonen hero w with Captain Nurumi, and yet he says these utterly brutal, seemingly heartless things that make us want to just, you know, hate him. I mean, we can't. Matsumoto has done his work too well in crafting this character. We can't really hate him. So when he says that, when he said that he it would be better to kill Kafka and just use the Kaiju number eight body as a weapon, it's like getting a bucket of ice water poured down your back. Not not bucket, maybe just a thin trickle from a cup of ice water poured down your back. It's really, really jarring. And it, throughout this whole situation, our boy Kafka, he's just sweating and stressing, and he knows his life is on the line here. And for Captain Narumi to be so callous while that's going on is really shocking, but it really shows you where their characters could develop at this point. And seeing Captain Narumi come to the realization that, yes, when it's time to kill a kaiju, skill is very important, but in real life, you have to show some compassion and it's not just it's not just the skill it's not just the intelligence that are valuable everyone is valuable and this is the major contrast we have here between our boy Kafka and Cap first, first Division Captain Jin Narumi. Kafka just embodies the concept that everyone's life matters, that everyone has that divine spark that gives them value and Jin Narumi seems to be so conceited that he only considers those valuable who have the particular skill set that he values in large enough amounts to be useful to him. 
And these are oversimplifications, of course, but watching these two characters interact is going to be wonderful. And of course, in the background of this chapter, we have Kokoru reacting to this. And she and Kafka are going to be together now, and hopefully that will give an emotional boost to Kafka. Another thing is I keep getting fascinated by the relationship between General Director Shinomaya and Captain Jin Narumi because Shinomaya is taking a lot of nonsense from Narumi and he just takes it quietly. He, now we know that the general director is entirely capable of shutting people down with his authority and those killer eyebrows of his. We saw him do it to the scientists when he went in to test Kafka and see if he could get him to transform and lose control. But he never does that with Narumi. He uses logic and words and just a quiet even tone. And even when Narumi is being tremendously disrespectful. And it just it gives me these glimpses of General Director Shinomaya's character. And I can't wait to find out more about that and just to see how his character unfolds over the course of this series. So that was my take on chapter 40. I'm really, really looking forward to the next chapter, of course. But because we didn't end on a cliffhanger, we ended a very satisfying end of the end of the story arc. We have no idea where the next chapter is going. Hopefully, we'll be getting to check in with our boy Reno. Now, what I'm really, really wondering, we know it's been at least five days. Uh, it was, it's been five days since Kafka woke up. We don't know how long it's been, how long he was out, but we're looking, we're looking at maybe a week or two since the incident at, with Kaiju number 10, back at the base where Kafka initially revealed himself. Now, the one thing that I really want to know is, is what is going on in Vice Captain Hoshina's head. He and Kafka were close. Kafka lied to him. Kafka, in a very real sense, betrayed him, and yet... Kafka was also willing to blow his secret to just to save the vice captain's life when the vice captain was battling number 10. And also, the vice captain was the only one who had any suspicion that Kafka was kaiju number 8, and there's got to be a lot of guilt going on there. So I can't wait to get back and see what's going on with Vice Captain Hoshina. But then we've got the, all the other boys to catch up to, the Three Stooges and Reno, and see what they're doing. And again, it's going to be a two-week wait, and I'm really excited. I guess I will talk to you guys later. Go check out my book, Humans Are Weird. I have the data, a book of human absurdity. Click on the link below, like, subscribe the video, and let me know what you think. Uh, do, you, do you see any other reasons that Big Daddy Shinomiya might have put Kafka in the first division as, as opposed to anywhere else? Leave a comment below if you do, and peace out, my wonderful viewers. The book from author Betty Adams, Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, is a humorous look at human behavior through the eyes of aliens. This book is arranged in separate reports or essays, documenting the experiences with humanity through the lens of the aliens who have to interact with them. This anthology of short stories and vignettes from alien points of view highlights some of humanity's quirks we can all relate to. Author Betty Adams captures how strange and interesting humans can really be. This is a fun collection of stories you will really get a kick out of. Humans Are Weird, I Have of the data from author Betty Adams. Order your copy right now on Amazon.